Well, welcome to another edition of the GIS Peer Success Webinar. I am your host, Toby Soto. I am the blogger behind GISSuccess.com, formerly known as MuniGovGuide.com, and I'm also the GIS manager for the city of Riverside in California. And uh, we do these webinars uh, for you. Uh, we tailor them in order to provide um, uh, information about GIS leadership and management, and we definitely uh, dive deep into best practices. And uh, it's really great to have you with us and enjoy the fact that you're here. Um, and we hope you get the best out of this, uh, this webinar. Uh, this is our fourth episode. It's on GIS technology challenges. And this kind of stemmed out of the Ask campaign that I uh, flew out there a few weeks ago. And I really appreciate all your guys' responses on that survey. And this happened to be one of the top topics was uh, dealing with the, the technology of GIS and trying to keep up. Um, we have uh, our normal panelists here. We have uh, Wade Kluse and Tim Nolan. And I'd like for them to take just a couple moments just to give them a, a quick bio about themselves so that everyone is kind of familiar with who you are. So go ahead, Wade. Okay, um, a quick bio. Um, let's see. Uh, I started off my career in, as a planner, a city planner. So it was a pretty natural transition to get into GIS. Uh, but I was doing uh, planning work out in Southern California. Um, and then I uh, transitioned over to work for Esri for about 12 years and uh, then migrated over to uh, one of my former customers and am now uh, GIS director for the Utah Department of Natural Resources. Um, I don't know, I guess one, one of the things I really tried to focus on here was really tried, trying to build uh, more awareness of the value that uh, GIS uh, delivers. So I've really been honing in on the question of the return on investment. So I spend a fair amount of my time working on that and that's transitioned into other process improvements, operational excellence type of categories. Here at the state of Utah, we've been focusing on thing, something called the theory of constraints as a process for improvement. So I spend uh, more and more of my time away from GIS and actually more on enterprise systems. So thing, anything from like advancing our teleconference capabilities to working with our IT shop and dealing with Google Enterprise. Um, somehow I got tasked with dealing with data security at the department. Uh, so I kind of got drafted for that one. I didn't volunteer for that one. And uh, lately, um, uh, one of the other questions Toby wanted us to answer was things that we're interested in, I think on a personal level. Uh, some of you who know me know that uh, I've been flying and designing model airplanes for 25 years. So actually one of the things I find myself working on right now is the integration of uh, uh, drones into our regular course of business. So trying to establish uh, a department-wide uh, UAS uh, policy, flight procedures, FAA compliance. Uh, we probably have 10 to 15 drones uh, throughout uh, our department. So trying to take kind of the wild, wild west of how everybody acquired those drones and practiced flying them uh, and moving that into a compliant environment is one of my current challenges. And, and actually, uh, given my interest, I really enjoy this, this aspect. There are so many opportunities, as Trisha might expand into, for the applications of drones for information collection and uh, decision making that uh, this is gonna change the way business gets done and it's really very exciting. So that's me in a nutshell. Awesome, all right, you're up, Tim. Yeah, I was uh, just thinking when I, when I started this job, I had a, my resume was only a half page and now that I've been here 25 years, maybe it's three quarters of a page. It's not, I, I don't really have a long, <laughs> other than the stuff that we've been doing here. I work for Collin County, Texas, uh, that's in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, my current position is applications manager. And uh, since I grew up and have been a GIS person my whole life, my adult life, uh, my beard was certainly a lot browner and had a lot more hair back then. But uh, uh, 
uh, I've done, you know, kind of our focus has been integrating a lot of the application development. That's the team that we have, one of the teams that we have over here, our records team and GIS and integrating those uh, all into one. I mean, I, I kind of think of it like uh, back in college when you had to write a term paper and you had three different classes that need a term paper and you're trying to make the one term paper be applied to all, <laughs> all three classes. That's kind of my, that's really been my uh, professional model here at, uh, here at Collin County is try to make something that we can do here be the solution uh, for GIS, for records, and for, uh, for application development. Awesome. Back to you, Toby. All right. And we have our special guest today, which is Trisha Brush. She is the GIS Director for the Planning and Development Services of Kenton County, Kentucky. Welcome. Can you give us a little background, a little bio about you, and how did you get to your position? Sure. I, um, well, we're, I'm in the Cincinnati area. For those of you who don't know where Northern Kentucky is, we're right across the river from Cincinnati. And the, I went to the University of Cincinnati, got my bachelor's in geography, and then met a Marine and moved out to Kansas City. Uh, ended up getting my MBA. I actually considered getting a master's in GIS but decided I needed to diver diversify my portfolio. And uh, so in case GIS didn't work out, I just wanted to have a backup plan. So I did get an MBA, which has actually served me very well. Uh, I was shortly after that, we moved back here to my home. He's from Colorado, so uh, he's he gets extra kudos for coming back to the Cincinnati area. And uh, so I've been here for 16 years. I thought I was staying for five, uh, but I have to tell you the one of the proudest things I have is I've built a team that's collaborative over the last 16 years, and I would put them up against anyone. Some of the awesome things we're doing here, and some of these came out of necessity. Uh, a couple years ago, they kind of said, uh, GIS, that's just bells and whistles. We don't, do we really need you? And it was at that point we had to justify our existence. Kind of what Wayne talked about is show that we're, there really was a return on investment. And then out of that, we had to grow and figure out what's next. And uh, we created Northern Kentucky Map Lab. That is something that we took. We have eight projects that we, or I'm sorry, 28 projects that we've done where we've taken data, created a poster and a story map and really tell the story of what the data, how it affects the citizens and uh, political officials of, of Kenton County. And uh, social media, we've gone to social media to market what we do. This year, the strategy is about GIS working in your community. And I just gave a presentation last Thursday about how GIS is in the headlines, but they don't really see it. I was just telling uh, Toby about us using some drone technology because it's flooding here in Cincinnati uh, and we're taking imagery of the floods we're uh, also checking pump stations for the sanitation district uh, we are also having um, some other things that are in the headlines uh, of course across the nation is active shooters and uh, we're using the drone to take campus pictures of all the schools in the area and uh, you know to make sure those those students get out safely. So really trying to push the fact that GIS is is really in the headlines, but uh, expanding upon that. Something about myself. Um, this year's theme for me is failing fast. Uh, if I don't fail, then I don't learn and I don't grow. Uh, success comes easy, right? Um, one thing that I'm trying that scares the heck out of me is I'm I've done triathlon for over 10 years since 2007 i'm doing a half ironman uh, 70.3 uh, race this year and um, the other thing is uh, as, as we're talking about drones is just trying a new technology something that's gonna maybe hopefully help your life or uh, make it better awesome man you got a lot going on there <laughs> And I just want to plug something real quick. Uh, if you want to learn more about Trisha, she's also on uh, Kurt Towler's Speaking of GIS podcast. Uh, that's uh, the most current podcast he has out right now. He did a great interview with her. And so you'll definitely learn a lot more about her background and, and what she's doing in, in uh, Kenton County. Um, I want to bring on uh, 
our resident technologist, uh, Isaac, because the, the next topic that we have is on, uh, let me bring up my uh, information here. Our first challenge is um, struggling to keep current on all aspects of enterprise ArcGIS platform, including portal, ArcGIS Online, SDE, ArcGIS Pro, Arcade dashboards, collector survey, you name it, and uh, UAVs. Uh, so much is uh, out there right now, and uh, trying to keep up with this is uh, very challenging. So. Uh, <clears throat> Isaac was on our uh, first podca uh, podcast, first webinar, and uh, he has just really uh, shown how much he really knows about the, the technology and GIS. So we brought him on board uh, to help participate. Uh, quickly, though, um, this challenge is something that we can all identify with. Uh, there's a number of products from Esri has increased over the past decade, especially since mobile technology has gone mainstream and uh, with the adoption of cloud-based technologies. Uh, each of these projects, uh, products has their own merit and they all service a particular need and are tightly coupled with each other within the, the platform. Um, you know, when there was, there's few products, it was a lot easier to, to keep up with those changes and, and to really dive deep into what those products can do and uh, you know you can start to really understand their capabilities and their limitations and how you can roll that out into the enterprise and now it's like you know with some of us which i know a lot of you can identify we have limited staff and limited time to invest in researching these products uh, so in essence we end up losing out on some of these opportunities to leverage this gis technology so uh, with that uh, trisha what uh, what have you done to help stay current uh, with these GIS technologies? Uh, it's uh, Esri reached out to us and they actually put together a um, a plan for us. Uh, what was nice is I talked to Justin Ogden and he actually said, "Tell me what all your people are doing and let me show you what the free t free training is." But something Toby that you've brought up is nobody has time for training. So I think that's where we really struggle is trying to find the time to, to do the training. Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a team of 10 people. And so to be honest, I'm doing more budgeting and, and uh, getting out and talking to people about what we're doing, uh, what the projects are, writing SOWs, statement of work. And uh, my team are really the experts. And I'm, it's fortunate that they're, they kind of have a niche, each one of them, they're subject matter experts, so they can stay uh, current on what their niche is. And if someone is outside their niche, they can go to the other person. Um, that's really, you know, we're, we're standing up portal right now. And in all honesty, today's like a bad day in my shop. Uh, I, my programmer is really struggling, my two programmers. Um, but you know, that's, They'll get through it and I have every confidence that they will. You're not alone in that struggle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel though. There, there. Good. <laughs> Isaac, what are you doing to uh, keep up with technology? You're, you're, I know you're, you're knee deep in that. I, th I think the one thing you can do to really, to really keep up with technology is to engage with your colleagues in the area and expand outside you know your your own gis bubble that you have it's so easy to get caught up in your day-to-day -day life that sometimes you forget that your priorities aren't the only thing that matter so i actively try to one thing that i do is i actively try to contact the other cities in our county as well as the other counties in california and coordinate with my peers figure out what what the ongoing trends are what the needs are figure out how that can relate to where I am now and then research those topics. So about a year ago, those topics were just, as you explained, different types of products that are offered and how they are applic applicable to us. Yeah, you know, I read white papers, I read the forums, but uh, it's really more like learning through doing. So you really have to take the time to either, as Trisha was saying, develop your staff or develop yourself and you know, take training classes for things you know your deficit in. If you know that you need um, 
you need some help in programming, get the help in programming too. If you know that, if you know that you don't have programmers on your staff, find a piece of software that can bridge that gap. Where if you need to, if your requirement is to have some type of web presence, find a piece of software like you know Latitude Geographic softwares. That's out of the box, you know. Or if you're going, if you're going to go with the way of portal, go and take the appropriate training so that you can launch it, or maybe even do with the help of professional services. It's not Esri, but there are other professional services. Like, for example, where Toby is, uh, is the like the city of Rancho Cucamonga itself mm -hmm. has professional services. So they not only do they have an intimate relationship with government, they they are government that helps other governments, which is really nice. So that, I think that working with people. One, uh, that are in my community, helping them, uh, staying up to date with the needs of not just what I need, but my users need. So keep it user driven. And then really trying to make opportunities for people to learn. And you're writing down what you have and sharing it. I've been trying to do that as much as possible, at least within the, the communities that I participate in. Yeah. You know, one thing that we've uh, tried to take advantage of too is uh, Israel will always have a, a beta testing opportunities, and so whenever that comes around, we'll we'll definitely hop on that just to get uh, our feet wet, just to know what is coming and what's happening, and, and uh, how can this apply to uh, what we're doing in house. Uh, so if you guys do have those opportunities, uh, definitely get into the beta testing groups. Yeah, there's a holistic testing too. That if you're into something like parcel fabric or portal they have holistic testing where you can go down to redlands and actually get get really hands-on with the developers and if that's something you're you'd like to try or that you need to be in touch with you know at every step of the way then that's something you can um, get yourself involved in i we have a whole our enterprise infrastructure has a whole test side as well so we're always testing something new so 10.6 we tested before we moved there we migrated all the enterprise to 10.6 you know portal everything we tested before we, we we move back over. So it's always good to have that as sandbox that people can fail in, like Trisha, what Trisha was saying, and then learn from mistakes and go from there. Yeah. What about you, Tim? Well, I was just thinking, so, uh, so we actually use consulting services because uh, we want to bring in, I mean, we have a small staff. Uh, we're really trying to embrace the technology. So knowing the inner work, like how to load, you know, we, we want, we want to move, move that on to someone else. And we've had a cons like a consulting uh, budget for years. And what, uh, just thinking about what uh, Isaac was saying about going to 10-6, we still are a bureaucracy, right? We're, we're in the county. So it took months for us to get the consultant on board and going. And we finally get, you know, we were going to finally get current. And the moment we went with 10-5, 10-6 came out. So, uh, so those are kind of the problems you face too, is that technology changes so quickly and you want to be on the edge, maybe not bleeding edge, but just the, you know, you want to make sure you take advantage of the new, the new pieces that are out there. Cause that's how these conferences are. You know, if you go to the conference, they always talk about the next thing coming out. So you want to go back and do those things, but you're not, you're not ready. You know, you don't have the software loaded in those types of things. One, one other comment I'd like to, you know, just kind of a word of advice for everybody is uh, if, if they ever have in your area a, a, like a, a GIS day or a David a, a event, you know, where they've got maybe, a, you know, a special speaker from Esri coming to talk about a new product or testimonials for other, just like a day conference, go to it, even if you think you're too busy. Because what happens is you learn a lot from these types of things because, as Trisha mentioned, you're already too busy to kind of even do the research your own. But if you're out of the office and you're away from, from all of the headache of the work or the stress of that work, then you could really open up and see and meet what other folks are doing. And that's the quickest way to pick up on some stuff. Uh, I think we had a similar experience with our GIS supervisor here was he was too busy to go, but I, I convinced him to go. And, and when he came back, he was very energized. And, and in fact, that really sparked our, our effort to upgrade. Yeah, that's key is uh, networking, you know, getting out and networking with other uh, organizations. Uh, yeah, we're fortunate to have a Rancho Cucamonga right up the street. We're fortunate to have Esri nearby. And we also have a very strong uh, user group too uh, in a uh, Inland Empire GS users group. And so, you know, just having that, that network out there that you can pick up the phone or, you know, chat on email and say, hey, what, what are you guys doing? How did you guys do it? What were... Uh, the pitfalls, what, what do we need to avoid? Uh, what, what can you do to do better? Uh, just to be able to have that network uh, is, is vital 
I think, in order to keep up with the technology. How about you, Wade? Well, I guess my, my take would be that uh, there's probably, you know, trying to uh, uh, always keep up on technology is not something that really keeps me up at night. I, I tend not to worry about it too much. I guess because I'd much rather spend my time uh, fully understanding what, uh, what my own operation has as either capabilities or limitations. And I think if I keep those things in front of me, that, um, you know, that way, as a means to filter everything that you can kind of get deluged with, with the periodicals and ARC News and, and, and all of those things, at least on the Esri front, that I tend not to get too, too caught up in trying to always know what the latest and greatest um, is all about. But I'm interested to, to kind of tune into the capabilities that I recognize that I may be interested in or I'm currently limited by. And having those ever present in, in my awareness helps me filter the incoming information. I get a lot of value out of what's new in, in terms of those types of blogs, the things that the current patches address, and to the extent that they match my current limitations or my desires, uh, then great. Then there's a connection and I focus my time there. So I don't think you can ever keep up with how fast this rolls, but I think it's important to set a priority to be your own assessment of your own capabilities and limitations and have that really be uh, you know, a filter for you in terms of all of the incoming information. So that's about all I would kind of put. Now, I do wanna just bring up a, a question that was asked, and this was, uh, uh, how do you uh, motivate and, and encourage your technical folks to stay on top of, uh, of the technology that they're responsible for? And I don't know if that's a question of motivation or expectation, but uh, I'll throw that out to the other panelists to see uh, what type of a response you guys have to that uh, chat question that was asked. I know in my shop, uh, my staff are always motivated. I mean, they're, they're pushing me to get to the next step. You know, um, For example, ArcGIS Pro, they're just like, okay, when can we start? When can we get into it? You know, and so I'll just find like, okay, you guys want Pro? We need to start dabbling with it. We need to start finding out what its limitations are. We need to find out where it excels and where do we need to uh, try other things to, to um, complete our workflows. Uh, so motivation on our end isn't uh, hard to get, um, but finding the time for them to really get into it is, is where we struggle. You know, and, um, but I do let my staff a couple hours a week be able to invest in some sort of training or in some sort of way of uh, looking into technology that's going to help improve their their workflow, improve their job, make it easier. You know, everyone's looking for something to make their job easier. So we we do give them that liberty to do that. Okay. Yeah, I got a quick comment on that is, uh, you know, so sometimes we get requests from these, uh, you know, subject matter experts or other folks that really just want some stuff. And uh, we usually take that opportunity to do something different. You know, let's try this in pro or let's see if we can do this in a different way. And that kind of sparks uh, encouragement because we're kind of in this together uh, approach. It's not just let me get get a map from the map folks. It's more like, well, what are you trying to solve, and then how can we solve it as a group, or as as a collective, and and that that tends to motivate some folks out there. We've had some good success that way. What about you, Trish? You have a big staff there. Uh, Toby, we're a lot like you in the fact that my team's motivated to try new things and and get in there and roll their sleeves up. Uh, this week, my programmer actually said. Trisha, I know you pay me to code and, and do programming and scripting, but I've been reading most this, mostly this week, bring, getting myself brushed up on, on things because obviously they're getting ready to go to the dev some, and uh, you know they want to they want to be armed with uh, questions and so they can get get some knowledge dropped on them. Um, you know, there's I don't really have to force that. If anything, they're dragging me. Definitely, like with the drone technology, I can't I. <laughs> 
I said, uh, okay, if that's what you want to do. And so now we're doing it. Yeah. How about you, Isaac? Uh, I've, I've kind of been through the different types of things that people mostly have. I've been, you know, federal, city, county. And, you know, you have various degrees of how people support training and they support their employees as well. It's really nice to hear, you know, Latricia staff and your staff as well. But I think that, you know, sometimes you're just trying to prove your worth and getting training is difficult to keep people, <laughs> keep people up to date. You know, so I think that um, once you're fairly established and you're spending 20 or $30,000 on this maintenance or software, I think that uh, the establishment of sustainable training income needs to be just as important as the licensing. And that, that's something we have here. So every, if you, people need justification or help with that. I'm willing to help write up the documentation for that, but I think that's a start. Getting training, getting a training budget that's stable, that's not something that fluctuates, is very important because that's how you're gonna empower your staff. You can read all you want online, but some software is very hard to get training for outside of the vendor. And some of that, uh, open source is fine, but um, you know, databases that, that can be learned, but some of the, I've found that some of the tool sets, that's like Esri and some of like that, two geographics, you can't find it anywhere except from their training. So I think it's important to uh, first justify, outline, and um, solidify ongoing training and ongoing training budget for your staff and yourself as well. Okay. Are there any other questions or Wade that you can say? Nope. Are we good? Nope, let's uh, move on nope. to the next question. Okay, let's do that. Uh, so the second challenging question was, uh, being able to use GIS as an integrated problem solver instead of using it solely to present a pretty picture of the problem. Trisha, how are you guys using uh, GIS to be more than just a pretty picture? Uh, I would say that's, that's where AGOL comes in for us. A lot of collector apps being built um, for asset management projects, could be tree inventory. Um, something that's happening here is the emerald ash borer and a lot of the ash trees are dying and we have actually had some fatalities. And so now we find the cities are, are because they don't wanna be liable, uh, they wanna do some tree inventories. And so we're arming them uh, with collector going out in the field and let them collect data. And uh, you know, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of the, maybe that's the easy answer um, we have a, a permitting system called track it that's basically stand up on GIS and uh, so all of our GIS data is used for that so that you know used on a daily basis we've rolled some of our zoning zoning people off of um, ArcMap and actually created uh, zoning analysts like an online map viewer for them just so we could kind of get rid of those licenses and uh, something else we feel, we found out last week is try to figure out how many maps are being printed on the website. We hadn't tracked this before, but uh, my programmer did some scripting and we found out that we're, we're serving up on demand, 270 maps got printed last week. And that, maybe that, I don't know if that sounds like a lot or not. It sounds like a lot to me, but when I think about it is that those people were coming in the door for my team to help them then that's a lot of maps. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, it's anything that we can integrate GIS into, we're, we're trying to do that and make it as painless as possible. Yeah. What about you, Tim? Well, we, we live for those types of projects. I mean, we, we actually seek them out. Um, you know, for being here so long, we want to be a solution provider, you know, not just a map team. And uh, so I can think of a couple of projects here recently uh, are, are, uh, under uh, Brad, our GI supervisor, uh, he worked on a project with our uh, our county judge. Uh, we have a major throughway in Collin County. It's a U it's a U.S. highway, but it's like an interstate. It's that big, and they're thinking about doing pass through tolls. And uh, we already have probably more miles of toll in in Collin County than anywhere else in the state. So we don't want another toll road, or at least the judge doesn't. And we're actually using GIS to solve ways that we can actually earn money maybe through uh, various cities contribution through uh, sales, sales tax and things like that to fund the highway instead of having the, the citizens fund the highway. 
And uh, to the point where, since this is election season, uh, I've even seen that show up along uh, local uh, people like, you know, you know, no toll over my dead body kind of thing. And I think it all stemmed from some of the work that uh, Brett and our GIS team was doing. Uh, another we, we just recently did is uh, it's, it's Collin County is a growth area and it's getting expensive to live here. They don't build cheap houses here in the county. And uh, one of the efforts was where do people live that work here? So we did an analysis. We had to, we had to go to uh, uh, AGO or GIS online to really map out. We've got some folks that live in Oklahoma. We've got folks that live all over the place, but it was a neat kind of glance at all of our employees and where do they actually live right now? Uh, and it kind of helped solve a problem that uh, some of our administration was having. So I like to look at, I don't look at GIS as GIS anymore. It's just more of a solution. And GIS is a tool that we can use to solve the problem. Yeah, you know, you, you talk about solutions and <clears throat> I kind of see it as, you know, you got your short-term solutions and you also have your long-term solutions. And your short-term solutions are like whatever the current hot topics are, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some economic analysis or some outreach analysis. Then you get into like your long-term solutions and this is where you really like get ingrained in the workflow. You get ingrained in the, the business processes and you start integrating with the business systems you know, such as your, like your permit system or your document management system or a 311 or computer aided dispatch. And uh, that's where you can start getting into like network outwork, network outage tracing or, you know, finding delinquent uh, business tax fees. You can really get a lot of ROI, you know, speaking for, for Wade there, you know, ROI out of your GIS system by being that integrated problem solver uh, with those long-term solutions. And they're, and they're fun projects. I mean, people love doing them. So the heart is in it too. So that's why the quality is always very high on these types of projects. Yeah. yeah. What you, Wade? Well, I think this really gets to the point of knowing your business. So whether you're a government employee or you're part of a private sector firm, uh, I think raising your, you know, uh, own assessment of your own uh, role in the organization, to, like, you know, fake it till you make it. If you're, you know, think of yourself as the decision maker that would solve your organization's biggest problem. And if you can link those business problems to your capabilities or a solution you could facilitate, that's how you get big returns. Uh, it's not so much, you know, I, I guess I remember back in the day where I was just happy to make maps and, uh, and, and solve problems that uh, were generally because of the lack of maps. But, uh, you know, to build it and hope that they come, I don't think is a very good uh, mantra for uh, having high value projects because the value is de defined by the organization. So if you're not engaging folks at the organizational level to say, what would you change if you could and what would make the biggest difference to your workflow and the ability to reach your goals if you're not asking those types of questions, then your impact is just less. And so maybe you become a little less of an integrated problem solver and a little bit more of a, a GIS hopeful that I kind of thought I could predict what people would want. Uh, you really have to engage at the business, at the core business capability level, and then you'll probably ensure that you become really the, the problem solver everybody wants to work with. And then you'll have more work than you know what to do with. Can I add on to what Wade, Wade was saying there? Yeah. And it, it, it may be a little bit, I'll give some examples of what Wade's talking about. And what he's really getting at the core of his business analytics and business intelligence. And that at its core is what the next level of GIS really is beyond just giving a report that's a map or a table to someone. You have to make these systems that, let's give an example, I work at a county. So we have a system for health that's a content management system just like Trisha was talking about similar to track it but it's just for health inspections but environmental health uses it who else um, different cell services environmental health hazmat a few others use it so what they're looking for is they're looking for the ability to GI for GIS and GIS applications to hook into their data and create meaningful reports and, and be able to report metrics back that they can't do themselves and that's where Wade's talking about if you can't create the tools or you can't create the uh, you can't, you, you really have to create the dialogue between those decision makers on that side and yourself to show, yes, you know what, we can take that data out and we can 
create, if it doesn't have spatial data, we can create spatial data and push the spatial data back into your database so that now your data is more meaningful. Or we can take the data out and aggregate it by spatial zip, whatever they want, and create some meaningful reports. So those reports could be anything from a, like insights for RT, insights RTS or some high charts that just show metrics. You know, another example would be another project we're working on, which is with animal services. They want to know how many registered dogs per, uh, how many dogs are registered under per zip code. Well, how are you going to meet that? With their system isn't a GIS enabled system. So you have to have that top and ability to be able to connect to that system and make it, make GIS the tool that they use, make it attractive and sell it to them. So that's, that's what I've been doing for the past. That's what I do and mostly. And it, it's the, it's, it has a large impact and it becomes part of their workflow. So it's an immediate ROI for your department because they see that you're critical to their business success. Sorry, sorry. Exactly. Awesome. Really great answers, you guys. I appreciate that. You want to go to the next uh, question or the next challenge? And that is uh, complying with cybersecurity and best practices. And we do have a special guest for that. That's uh, John Tidwell from Collin County, Texas. And he is uh, an IT security officer for them. And let's get him up on board here. Here he comes. So, you know, <clears throat> most, most organizations have taken cybersecurity very seriously, uh, especially with the risk of uh, the most infamous ransomware and uh, also penetration to, to gain control of vital business systems and uh, accessing, uh, accessing uh, personal identifiable information, uh, PII. Um, those have been the, on the major forefront here at the city of Riverside. And, uh, we have a, a CSO that's just doing a bang up job as well and in, in mitigating a lot of these issues. And uh, I'd like John to kind of give us a little uh, uh, best practice in, in dealing with a lot of these issues and, and how they can pertain to GIS because we do have public facing applications and they do go into um, behind the firewall and, and grab information. So, but there's, you know, from a, a CSO standpoint, uh, it's just best to hear from the experts. So if you can give us some tidbits there, uh, John, appreciate it. Oh, can't hear him. Still on, I think you're on mute. <laughs> it's getting close. Nope. This is any better? There you yeah. go. <laughs> okay. And right, it's a close up of my face to go along with all of this. <laughs> so that was my answer. I don't know if you missed it while you, while you couldn't hear me. Um, <laughs> Good in answer. terms of following best practice in the local government space, um, cover a topic about information sharing and, and networking earlier. The, uh, we have access to the MSI SAC, the Multi State Information Sharing and Analysis. Center. And they work with CIS to develop a, uh, a framework that's pretty easy for somebody R. I shouldn't say easy, very hard, like everything. But they provide the um, CIS 20 critical controls, which are a guide to you know, maybe secure your environment. And they're prioritized. You know, the first five are kind of the low hanging fruit to really get a hold of what's going on in your environment to identify and understand what you have from both a software and hardware aspect. And then they work their way down. As you mature, you get up to the 19 and 20 of the world and you perform pin tests to, uh, to test the, app the application of your security controls. So that's something that we're following. It's, it's a standard. It's something that we can, we can share with to, to ask other municipalities our size. How are you doing with control one for assets or how are you doing with you know, secure configuration? And it's a, it's a, it's a journey to, to get across, uh, to get all those checks box filled. One thing that helps with it as well is that it's measurable with all the sub controls. You know, are you doing this one? Yes or no? It's something I can take to my boss to say, Hey, when I first got here in uh, 23 years ago, you know, we weren't doing these first five. Now we're halfway to getting the first three done. It's, it's something that we can do progress. And I think the biggest thing, and I don't know if this is a, a best practice, but it's something that I've actually learned working with, with Tim here is, um, you know, 
we're racing security is a team sport. While it is, it's my job to worry about the nerdy ones and zeros of it. Um, when we do application, uh, web application scanning and, and pen testing, that's something where it helps me to have Tim's team involved in the room. One of his developers is one of my biggest uh, banner waivers for application security, and we spent some budget dollars to send him to a web app pen testing course. But it's something where, um, for my tool, that's anything security based, anybody who wants to learn, I'll give them read access to it just to kind of see what's going on. And that's just something where we have to share. And it helps with uh, not building a culture of no. Uh, that's a very career limiting move in the information security. We're not gonna earn friends that way and we're not gonna get anything done. But if uh, giving access to our tools helps me you know, do better based on somebody on the service desk, you know, finding a flaw and being able to fix it, then that's just a win all the way around. Yeah. And what, what about best practices with uh, vendor management? Because uh, a lot of us uh, bring vendors into the workplace to help, you know, implement, stand up, you know, different uh, servers and applications. Uh, what are some of the best practices uh, in dealing with vendors? Sure. So, um, oddly enough, I was out last week in a training uh, taking the SANS legal course. And one of the days was just dedicated to, uh, you know, vendor management and just trying to ingrain that it really starts at the, uh, the RFP process for, for tools and making sure that when you're signing contracts, you are defining that this vendor who's going to help us out, this is what they're going to provide. A big security risk is how are they going to access our network to help us out when they need to provide remote support can we lock them down to just a certain part of the network or do they request, you know, wide access, to the wild, wild west. And that's something where it's, it's a culture change. Uh, I've been in my spot for about three years, but we've had contractors, you know, for, you know, the, as long as the county has existed. So that's something where we're having to go back and do some identification on our part. And we're, we're following this step where, and a lot of my peers are doing it, where we're just looking through logs, looking through configurations, see who has access to what, what are they using on a repetitive basis and how do we trim it down from there and then have that conversation where we can be a partner with these vendors and say, look, these are the three systems you have access to. We're going to lock you down to just this and make sure you can still do your job. And then let's go back later uh, and use that as a lesson learned moving forward. So when the next new partner comes in with the new technology, that's great. We set that foundation from the beginning that we are going to limit your, your access to both protect us, but then also to protect you. And having that two-way conversation where it's almost Jerry Maguire-ish, you know, help us help them. We want to protect them from other vendors inside the, the county the way that they would want to be protected themselves. So if we, if we start with that conversation where it is a partnership, um, where we're actually seeing some, success, some successes in that area because we, we have some vendors that have the keys to the kingdom and we're trying to lock that down, but they've been very forthright with, you know, saying, hey, yes, we need to protect ourselves. So trim us down so that, you know, we're not the first person you look at if you have a breach there at Collin County. Yeah. Yeah, that that's uh, uh, the vendors definitely don't want to be liable as well, you know, and uh, definitely don't want to make the the newspapers with the city or county or organization that they just had a major data breach, you know, because of uh, they let the they sticky noted the password on a on a laptop, you know, something of that nature. So yeah, that's really good information to know. Hey Isaac, I know you're you do a lot with application development and also, you know, standing up servers and um, well, what are some of the things that you guys have done to help mitigate, you know, some of the cybersecurity and stuff? We have a, we have an active WAN group that's responsible for all that. So we have like set policies for what vendors can and can't do when they come in and what they're limited to. I think even when we give the uh, vendors like VPN access, they only have access to certain things. They don't have, they're very restricted on what they can and can't do even when they're on site and we're going through an we go through audits so we're going through an audit right now we're going through a d um, sometimes we're going through a security audit and a dr uh, audit right now so those are those are kind of the things that can keep you and what um, the previous speaker is talking about i've gone to a couple of the meetings about security in sacramento and it, as long as you participate in those meetings they have like he said they have a um, white papers and framework pieces of uh, documentation that you could start your own audits. You can, you can start the work to create, you know, to harden your own security and learn more. There's a quite a bit, it's a, it's a full-time job being a, a security analyst or a, um, 
there, if you look at, if you look, everyone's looking for, um, in California is looking for a chief security officer right now, every county. So it's, it's a very hot topic and it's very important. As you said, as people are falling victim to phishing and those, those types of things, it's a ongoing, I've been going to the security things in Sacramento for the county, California counties, and it's an ongoing trend of, you know, it's its own, it's, it's as big as GIS and it's a full-time job. That's all I have to say about it. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, <clears throat> I mean, we could probably have four or five people constantly doing uh, uh, security checks here in the city because there's just so much to, to deal with. You know, what, another thing that we've kind of had to grapple with is with ArcGIS Online, you have the ability to create individual accounts up there or you can connect through uh, ADFS single sign-on. And, um, you know, we're definitely a, a single sign-on type shop uh, because the onboarding and offboarding of uh, employees just makes things a lot more difficult uh, to deal with trying to find out, you know, is this person here, is this person left? What do we do with their data? You know, uh, what permissions do they have? There's just a, a lot of um, um, maintenance that goes involved in, in um, trying to maintain uh, single, uh, not single sign-on, but uh, individual accounts in, in AGOL. Uh, are you guys using a uh, single sign-on in yourself, uh, Isaac? Um, right, not right now, no, because we're decentralized IT. So we're the, we're, we're the remnant of the decentralized IT, but we have so many different forests, which are uh, different. You can think of it as if people aren't tech, I don't want to talk, Tech, too technical, but basically, you know, you log into your computer, it's say like it's city of um, Riverside, right? You know, like whatever the slash your name. Well, we have one for health, we have one for EHSD, we have one for election. So we have many for, so it doesn't work. So we have to do, we have to do that type of sign on, but uh, we just try to keep up with it. We have um, document stores on our team foundation servers so that when we do change anything from database users changing to passwords changing, there's a log of new users, old users, and there's an audit trail of what's happening, who's being added, who's being subtracted, so we can keep very tight on security for who has access to what. And I constantly am auditing who's doing what as well. It's mm -hmm. kind of an active process and it takes part, of, that's part of my job is to manage that. But one thing you can do, one small thing you can do just for security wise, that if you are exposing things to the web, through ArcGIS Online is stand up a separate database and just uh, have it not connected to anything else. You know, put it in the DMZ. That way, if you, it gets compromised, that's all that gets compromised and you don't have all the other personal, all of the protected data within your internet being um, compromised. I mean, that's one small step you can take. Yeah, that, that's a really good uh, uh, tidbit of information there so regarding the, the DMZ and having some uh, data replication up there. Uh, so they don't have to penetrate, you know, into the back end of your, your network. Yeah, or even better, what I'm going to, where we're doing POC with is we're just going to have our web-facing services in Azure, AWS, or Google. We're doing POCs with all of them. So we'll figure out which one's best, and that'll be the guide for stuff we put on the web. So mm -hmm. it, offload, it offloads the internet load, and it secures it so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Awesome. Anything else you want to provide there, John, for us? No, I think I would just follow up on one point that Isaac made, which was the uh, the active process of identifying uh, identity for folks. That's that that's a challenge and that's tough. But um, he hinted at a very important point, which is uh, kind of attesting, you know, who has access to what and making sure that that is uh, constantly, uh, well, I shouldn't say constantly, revisited on on a timely basis. Uh, you know, with we're in a government where you know lots of opportunities to take separate jobs and um, it's as department, people's move from department to department, you know, you need to take away what access they don't need and give them what access they do. But um, that's where in my particular role it helped almost, almost running for office, uh, going out and meeting with department heads and just meeting with them on a constant basis to say, okay, your folks need this type of access. Is that still right? Making sure I can explain it in a non-technical forum so that we can apply that properly to, uh, to, to lock things down. But it's a, uh, Security is, it's an ongoing thing, and that's uh, something that, that Isaac hit the nail on the head on with the active processes. Yeah, I know. Very good. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate uh, your commentary. Uh, thanks, Tim, for uh, sure. uh, giving us John's contact. Uh, that definitely has been very, very useful for us. 
Uh, I just want to go real quick, just kind of go around the room and see if there's any last minute comments, you guys, or anything you want to plug. Uh, Trish, you, you have anything that you want to plug for anybody or anything that you're doing? Uh, definitely love for everyone to go out and check out linkjs.org. Uh, we did just put out uh, KPIs out there, and um, but definitely the map lab for sure. And when you get to the map lab, check out several of the labs at the and at the bottom you'll see a story map companion piece with each one. I think you'll find uh, them very interesting and intriguing. And uh, the only other thing I'll say is we learned. Uh, when we were going through kind of the the grinder about how to prove that GIS is not just bells and whistles, that you can't leave anything to chance. And that if you, you got to get out there and build relationships and meet people and, and tell them what you're doing because they, they won't figure it out by themselves. Yeah, you definitely got to promote what you're doing for sure. Uh, Tim, you got any last minute comments? Well, uh, and it kind of goes back to what John was saying and Isaac. Uh, we're pretty fortunate here that the GIS is part of IT. So when we ask for, hey, we need some test servers to try this or try that, it's not a big ordeal. Uh, if you're not, and, and I know that there's some folks out there that struggle with their IT departments, uh, this is an opportunity, right? This is an opportunity under the auspices of, of secure data or secure environment to really get a better relationship going on with your IT to, so they can, they can better understand the needs of GIS and then GIS can have better have an understanding of the sort of the needs of, you know, the, the IT department on, on, on protecting and securing data. And maybe that those requests become a little easier. You know, hey, you know, we wanna make sure this is the safest thing. This is the kind of environment that we need. And the, the battle's not as, not as rich as it used to be. So I think there's, a, there's an opportunity here for those that are struggling between their GIS and IT departments uh, with, with security in mind. Very good. Isaac, any last comments? I just want to plug the technology channel and the, and the GIS success slack. So if anyone has any questions or anything, I'll be actively monitoring that. Yep, and Isaac is our, our resident. Tech. <laughs> he has offered uh, to monitor that, that channel. So uh, anything you guys want to put in there, uh, he's got some great white papers out there as well. Uh, you may want to promote that in there in that tech channel. Isaac it was uh, really, really good information. And uh, what about you, Wade? Um, I guess just a, a couple of thoughts on the matter of security. I think that it's easy for a lot of folks to, in the GIS world to say, you know what, our whole business is about promoting data. So our data is public. So we may not, you know, really treat security too well, or, or have to worry about it. But I really think that uh, this really does need to be on GIS professionals radar with regards to really the integrity of your data. Because if somebody breaches into your system and uh, all of a sudden they can start messing with your data, that's your reputation. And you could have taken measures to secure your network. You know, there's, you know, when there's trials and tribulations about just moving to HTTPS, uh, th those don't always go, you know, smoothly. But um, so I, I just wanted to push out there that it's more than just, uh, you know, hey, I don't have sensitive data. So data security is not that big of a deal. But do think of the integrity of your data or the disruption of service of your, of your data. You know, a lot of folks, are, you know, I think we in the GIS field aspire to be the ones that get noticed or, or get notified as soon as a, an application goes down. And if it, you get noticed within seconds of something going down, you know you have a very critical system to your organization, which is a good thing. So don't jeopardize it by not taking data security and access security uh, seriously. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to bring up was, uh, we did get a, a few, uh, well, we, we had one inquiry about uh, asset management and what what folks are doing to integrate asset management. I think that is certainly a, a potential topic for uh, another session. I think that would really hit on the, the local government uh, users uh, radar as being you know, something that is uh, uh, really of interest and in, an in important uh, point of integration for GIS. So I'll just kind of flag that as, uh, couldn't do it this time, but maybe we can uh, touch base 
back on that on, on a asset management centric uh, web session. Yeah, I think that's a great idea because uh, that is uh, something that's really important, uh, at least at the local level and uh, utility level, uh, is asset management. And uh, we yeah. definitely could spend a whole webinar just on that topic alone. So yeah, we'll, we'll chalk that up for sure. Okay. And I did, uh, John did uh, say that he would uh, share the uh, security white paper with me and then we'll get that on the Slack uh, community uh, website. Awesome. Very good. All right, everybody. Well, I think that concludes our edition of the Jazz Peer Success webinar. Again, I want to thank you, Tricia, for attending and being our special guest. Uh, you provided some great information and some great synergy amongst uh, the conversations here. And um, to you, Isaac, and uh, to you, John, and, and Tim and Wade, I appreciate all your, your support and, and uh, uh, providing uh, the way for GIS peer success to keep moving forward. So I appreciate that. Um, we will uh, post this on YouTube. So if you missed part of it, uh, this time I will have the whole thing recorded. <laughs> Way to go, Toby. <laughs> and uh, it'll be on the, the YouTube site and we will have all those links on the, G um, the GIS success Slack uh, site as well. So. If you want to continue the conversation, we'll also be heading over there to Slack. So if you have any questions that uh, weren't answered or came to light later on, uh, we will definitely be monitoring the Slack group as well. So other than that, uh, I will release everybody. Thank you for being on. And uh, we will uh, definitely keep in contact and let you guys know when the next webinar will be and the, and the topics. And uh, we'll go from there. Thank you, everybody. All right. Have a good day.